Hi everyone, welcome to this video all about Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. This is for A-level English Literature B with AQA, the Unseen Extract Practice for Paper 2 Section A for Political and Social Protest Writing. This extract came up in 2017 and it was the first extract that the exam board used in this new um, specification. So we're going to be looking at this extract today to practice uh, being able to analyse an unseen extract, which will always in some way be related to the genre of political and social protest. So the aims of this session are these. Um, we need to first make sure that you are familiar with the question because the question will always be the same for this task. Uh, and it's AO4, really, which is leading the way with this task. I'll explain more about that um, in a second. Um, it's also really important to reinforce the importance of the extract synopsis as a source of information. So this is the box of information that the exam board writes for you above the beginning of the extract. And it will include things like dates and potential AO3 contexts potential information about characters as well. So it's really important that you don't overlook that synopsis as a source of evidence and information. Um, we're also going to consider significant social and historical contexts for this extract, which is A3. Very easy, I always find, for social and political protest writing to include A3 because it is very much concerned with what is real. Um, so it shouldn't be too difficult for A3 for this task. I'm then going to get, go through the extract and analyse it with you, um, always in relation to the genre of political and social protest. So we can't just analyse the extract generically. We have to always see it through the lens of the genre of political and social protest. Um, I'm then going to look at some AO1 and AO4 terms that you can use in, in um, conjunction with this extract as well. And finally, I'm going to go through with you an introductory paragraph example as a good way to start the essay um, with, with how you can really use the synopsis at the beginning to really help and, and give your essay direction with a very strong introduction. So it's quite a busy session, uh, which you can probably tell from the length of this video. OK, but we will, by the end of this, hopefully be really, really familiar with this extract so you can then go and write a fantastic essay about it. OK. Before we start, it's really important that you have maybe some materials with you. So a blank copy of the extract would be advantageous. Um, I often print these unseen extracts on A3 for my students. It just gives them more room to annotate. A couple of highlighters, a pen, some extra paper for notes maybe, and also some sticky notes perhaps as well. So it's really important that because I'm doing this video more like an online lesson, it's important that you have the capacity to make notes and annotations as we go through, which you will then be obviously using to help write the essay. OK, so it's always good to have the right stationery with you. So as I said in the aims slide, the question for this unseen extract is always the same and it is primarily concerned with AO4. What that means is that this is really an exercise in genre study. Uh, and obviously, by this point, by, by the time you've sat the exam or an assessment on this paper, you will have spent at least a year studying political and social protest writing. So what the examiner says is they should be able to give you anything and you be able to um, highlight to them why that extract fits into that genre. So this is really testing your ability um, to look at the genre and link themes of political and social protest writing to an unseen extract. So it's no surprise that we have that phrase elements of political and social protest writing in the actual task and it's 25 marks as is always the case for um, literature to be. So the question is always explore the significance of elements of political and social protest writing in this extract. Um, so really AO4 is leading the way. The examiner knows that you haven't probably seen this extract before um, but what they want you to do is to use the extract as an example of how you understand um, the, the, the genre itself. And because you've studied at least three texts from this genre, uh, a novel, some poetry, a play maybe, um, it's important that you have picked up stuff. And you might have already said a lot about this extract, a lot about the elements of this extract in other texts 
that you will often find crossovers and themes and imagery perhaps as well. So AO4 is the key um, AO for this task and it's important to obviously familiarise yourself with those elements um, as soon as possible for this course. So that's the, that's the task, okay? So, at the beginning of your extract, you will always get a synopsis, which the examiner has written for you. And one of the things that I always say to students is, you must engage with this synopsis because it's been written for you to help you. In other words, the examiner knows that it can be quite scary to sit an exam for an A-level and be working with text that you haven't even had the luxury of studying before. And they know that. Um, so the reason why they have written this synopsis for you is to help you contextualise an extract. And it will have important information in it that you must really engage with and use in your essay. Things like key dates, um, characterisation, themes, imagery, perhaps. So before my students even read the extract itself, we spend sometimes up to half an hour discussing and highlighting the synopsis that is often printed at the beginning because it's important to contextualise the extract. So the synopsis for this extract for Fahrenheit 451 said the following. It says the novel Fahrenheit 451 was written by Ray Bradbury in 1953. The title refers to the, to the approximate temperature at which book paper burns. Set in the 24th century, the novel presents a world in which ownership of books is banned by the repressive state. Firemen are responsible for burning any books which are discovered. The story follows the experience of Guy Montag, a farmer who wonders why books must be destroyed. His friend Clarice McLennan, who prompts him to question the power of the state, has mysteriously disappeared. Montag has been hiding books in his home in an attempt to discover why they are banned, but has not told anyone he is doing this. In the extract, Montag has reported for duty at the fire station and is discussing the role of firemen with his superior officer, Captain Beatty, in the presence of his colleagues. So there's lots of information there that is potentially fruitful in order to be along the right lines of this extract. Um, I quite like this question. When you see past the intimidation of, of it being something you haven't worked with before, it's about having confidence in your abilities. You have been studying A-level English literature by this point for two years, and you have also studied it at GCSE. So you are very expertly skilled and in a good place to be looking at an unseen extract. You might not think it, but it's about believing in yourself. And I like this question because it gives us freedom to look at a lot of different extracts rather than just stick to the set text that's in the specification. So once you understand um, you know, the elements and the themes of political and social protests and the imagery, this isn't actually that scary a task. It can actually be quite enjoyable to do because it, it practices and, and it's something new to look at um, and apply your learning to the broader world of literature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that you can pause this video now and begin to highlight um, which bits of this synopsis you think are most useful in terms of how to contextualise this extract. Okay. Then what I will do is I will then colour code which bits and also label for you, we'll go through them, how much information this synopsis gives you about the, the extract itself, which you can potentially use in your essay. Okay, So pause this video now, take as long as you need, to highlight all the um, important information, the significant information that you think is important to the analysis of this extract, and then we'll go through in a second. OK, so you can see here that I have really quite gone to town with my colours <laughs> and I have um, annotated and um, really expanded as much as I possibly can on how this information that the examiner writes for us, remember, to help us, how useful it is uh, in terms of introducing us to this extract. And this is why it should never be overlooked, because it is very carefully thought through. So if we go from top to bottom, so we're first told that this book was published in 1953 and it's clearly a novel. So that could be important in terms of form or structure. But it's a 20th century, quite contemporary novel set, obviously, um, in the future. So it, it's almost speculative in a way. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. 
We're told then that Fahrenheit 451 is all about the temperature at which book paper burns. Um, you might have done or, or come across something similar in your studies, maybe in history or in other literature texts, which is that when you burn books, you're clearly destro you're destroying and exterminating knowledge. You're exterminating or destroying academic freedom um, as a way of a repressive state control. So when we're burning books, it's obviously something that has been made into law by a repressive regime. So already we're starting to see things like um, control, freedom or lack of it, repression, all these kind of elements of political and social protest writing coming through. As we said, it's set in the 24th century and the novel represents a world in which ownership of books is banned by the repressive state. So the examiner here gives you one of the elements for you, repressive state. That can often be a significant um, kind of theme in political and social protest writing. So oppression, control, repression, it's set in the future. So it could be quite speculative as well. It's a bit like The Handmaid's Tale um, in the sense that it speculates about what could be around the corner, um, even in democracies. We never quite know what the future holds. The future has many possible futures, not just one. And the future will depend on who is in power. So clearly in this dystopian world here, and that's a good word we'll come back to, I'm sure, time and time again. In this dystopian world, um, something trivial like books are banned. And, you know, if we think of our homes, I'm sure we've all got books in them. And in this world of this text, um, the books are illegal, so they become almost contraband. Firemen are responsible for burning the books, which is interesting, isn't it? Because obviously Bradbury has used the firemen as a motif or a device to carry out the repressive behaviours of the government, the repressive laws. So rather than um, firemen um, putting out fires and protecting people and saving people, here their roles have been reversed as part of that dystopia and they're actually responsible for burning the books, but also the houses as well that those books are within. Complete destruct destruction. Um, the story follows the experience of Guy Montag. So Guy Montag is our protagonist, a fireman who wonders why books must be destroyed. So he's daring to wonder, that kind of mental verb there. He's daring to wonder why the state is doing this. And obviously, when you are living in a, in a kind of a um, totalitarian regime or a, a very dogmatic world, those people that rebel and those people that dare to question the powerful elite are the ones who often get into trouble. Uh, and that can mean numerous things. Um, his friend, Clarissa McLennan, who prompted him to question the power of the state, so that's obviously rebellion, has mysteriously disappeared. So again, Clarisse, um, who dared as well to question the power of the state and what it's doing, has mysteriously disappeared. So again, suppression, voicelessness, a sense of punishment coming through. We don't know in the section like, what's happened to him. So clearly, having a mind of your own and daring to question the powerful elite can lead you into a lot of trouble and in fact, you might disappear to who knows where, perhaps killed. Montag has been hiding books in his home in an attempt to discover why they are banned. So that yellow section, we've got rebellion and secrecy. He knows he's not supposed to be having these books on him, and yet he's doing so. So it, potentially he's putting himself in at risk of a lot of trouble here. And he's not told anyone he's doing that. So again the secrecy of that, the danger, but also for a reader obviously creates tension and suspense because we want to know if he's going to be safe or whether or not he's going to be found out. In this extract, Montag has reported for duty. So that phrase reported for duty, again, following orders, um, obviously an ironic use of the word duty, perhaps, because again, we expect firemen to report to duty to protect people and put out fires. And yet here, the farmer could also be argued as being radicalised and manipulated by the government in order to carry out the government's um, wants and desires. So to what extent the firemen have been victimised can also be something interesting to talk about for AO5. Do you see the farmer as the baddies or are they actually just victims of a repressive government and are just doing as they're told because otherwise they might have to pay the ultimate price? They dare not, for example, um, do anything else. 
The fire station as well for AO2 is important, the use of settings. Obviously, a fire station we think about uh, as being a place where we associate with people who are saving us, who are protecting us. And yet now you can imagine the fire stations are seen as a, as a symbol of, of intimidation almost, because people know that those firemen are not going to put out fires, but actually start them if you have possession of books or literature. Um, there's also uh, a name there, Superior Officer Captain Beatty, and often in political and social protest texts, character names or titles can often be a good sign or symbol to work out some kind of hierarchical structure. So obviously being called Captain demonstrates that he perhaps has more power and influence in this fire station than Montag does or the other men. So the dynamic between Captain Beatty and Montag can also be something to talk about as well. There might be slight rivalry between them, but also a, a dynamic rooted in intimidation, perhaps. And finally, we have the presence of his colleagues. So again, you get the sense of collectivism, and that can be something else that you can talk about for this genre of writing, political and social protest. There is a sense that because there's multiple of them together, there's a sense of risk to Montag's actions. In this kind of situation, um, if anybody gets wind that you are not doing as you're told, then chances are people will turn on you. And what happens is that creates a sense of paranoia because everybody tells and everybody else. In other words, you've, nobody's got any loyalty to you anymore. You're all trained almost to tell on each other. And that's what happens with the handmaids and the handmaid's tale. They're also encouraged to tell on each other as well. So there's no sense of friendship, really, unless they rebel and go underground like um, Offred and Offglen do. Um, but it's also a sense of, of secrecy there um, as well. There's a sense of paranoia. If you think about the coronavirus pandemic and the lockdown, the government actively encouraged citizens to tell on their neighbours if their neighbours were having parties which were against the rules. You would think that you would get on with your neighbours. Um, but recently, interestingly, we've also gone through a period where the government has encouraged people to uh, dob in their neighbours if they were having parties during lockdown. And that creates a sense of paranoia sometimes because people don't trust one another when perhaps they should be able to. So in summary, then, you can see, and obviously this is a video, so you can pause this video however often you want to and go back however much you want to as well. But there's an awful lot of information that is very useful here that we need to take on board in order to do well with this essay, because these synopses have been carefully thought through to help us, because the examiner knows that we are not dealing here with a set text that we've had the luxury of studying for months, or if not years. So we really need to engage for at least uh, 10 to 15 minutes, perhaps, on understanding the significance of these points. OK. OK, for the social and historical context, which is AO3 for obviously this specification, there's plenty for this particular genre of political and social protest writing because um, these texts often concern with what is real. They are inspired by real events. So again, I know I keep referring to Handmaid's Tale, but Handmaid's Tale obviously is about um, uh, things like uh, Nikolai Shazescu and his rule about Romanian children in the 1960s. Nothing in that book is made up. The Kite Runner is informed by Afghanistan, Russian invasion of Afghanistan, American invasion 9-11. Uh, the Doll's House is inspired by um, the Scandinavian marriage and domestic sphere of the institution of marriage and the impact that has on female identity. You've got Blake about um, the Industrial Revolution, French Revolution and so on. So all of the texts for this particular genre are very heavy in AO3. One of the things I want to make clear, though, is this is not a history essay. And I've had history students before who have insisted on writing a lot of historical context just because they might have done it themselves as part of a project, perhaps, or a course for element in history. Please remember that this is literature and AQA wants you to engage with social and historical context in a way that it doesn't take over your essay, but is there to complement your analysis of literature. So it's there to help you make interpretations and come to particular conclusions about it. So please don't feel that you have to, you know, fill your essay for unseen extracts or indeed any essays for literature with lots of dense history. It's there to help your analysis, not take over. When my students did this back in 2017 and subsequently when we have looked at this in class as a practice paper or a mock, many students are able to mention the Nazi book burning of Jewish literature in 1933 as a real example of censorship 
where a political and quite far right repressive regime have tried and attempted to control thought and knowledge. Um, so again, this might remind you of that. Um, obviously, book burning originates from a cultural, religious or political opposition to something. Um, Nazi book burning is often the most well known, but the burning of literature has happened right back since the Qin Dynasty in China in 213 210 BC. So book burning in culture has actually existed for a very, very long time indeed. If you can use things like this in your Unseen Extract analysis, it would be a bonus. It doesn't mean you're going to fail this essay if you don't, but it's you, some of you might be able to link to particular movements in history where book burning has occurred, such as the Nazi book burning in 1933, for example, as part of their um, regime. So literature and the pen can be powerful tools of protest, as we know from this module, but literature can also be controlled, rationed and destroyed very easily because obviously they are, the literature is physically represented by objects like books that can be burned. If you have studied The Doll's House, that book, for example, that play was um, banned for time because it was so shocking, the ending. Um, so literature can often be a, pow a powerful tool of protest. And that's one of the reasons why I quite like teaching this module, because it's rooted in what's real. And it takes literature away from just something literary to something much more real, rooted obviously in social realism. So um, that is a key potential thing to say for AO3 for this uh, response. Something else you can say as well for AO3 um, is all about um, Benjamin Franklin. And this will make sense, I suppose, once we've read the extract. But Benjamin Franklin is specifically referred to at the end of this extract. If you turn to the back page, uh, he's mentioned there. And a quick bit of research. Franklin co-founded the Union Fire Company on December the 7th, 1736, also known as the Bucket Brigade. After a series of publications in Pennsylvania in the United States uh, by Franklin, pointing out the need for some uh, effective handling of fires in Philadelphia. So when you read the end of this extract, bear in mind how Bradbury has used that information um, to uh, coincide or to reinforce the dystopian atmosphere of this repressive regime of book burning in Fahrenheit 451. So we might come back to that later. But that's something else, which if you know that would be a bonus in your essay. OK, so just bear that in mind. We'll come back to that um, a bit later on. So let's dive in then to the extract itself. And you can see I've screenshotted it. I'm going to read through this um, with you. Uh, so if you've got the blank extract in front of you, uh, follow it with me. And then what we'll do is we'll split this into sections and we'll, we'll, we will begin to analyse particular bits that are significant for an essay, perhaps. So we've looked at the synopsis. We're now ready to read the extract. And what I say to students is you might, it, you might want to read the extract through twice in the exam. Once just to get the gist and the second time with more of a critical eye in order on that second reading to be able to start highlighting things and noticing devices or particular themes and so on. So I'm only going to read this once, but obviously it might be worth reading through it again if you um, need to. So it says a radio hummed somewhere. War may be declared any hour. This country stands ready to defend its. The firehouse trembled as a great flight of jet planes whistled a single note across the black morning sky. Montag blinked. Beattie was looking at him as if he were a museum statue. At any moment, Beattie might rise and walk about him, touching, exploring his guilt and self-consciousness. Guilt? What guilt was that? Your play, Montag. Montag looked at these men whose faces were sunburnt by a thousand real and ten thousand imaginary fires, whose work flushed their cheeks and fevered their eyes. These men who looked steadily into their platinum igniter flames as they lit their eternally burning black pipes. They and their charcoal hair and soot-coloured brows and bluish ash-smeared cheeks uh, where they had shaven close, but their heritage showed. Montag started up, his mouth opened. Had he ever seen a farmer that didn't have black hair, black brows, a fiery face, and a blue still shaved but unshaved look? These men were all mirror images of himself. Were all farmen picked for their looks as well as their proclivities? The colour of cinders and ash about them, and the continual smell of burning from their pipes. Captain Beatty was there, 
rising in the thunderheads of tobacco smoke. BT opening a fresh tobacco packet, crumpling the cellophane into a sound of fire. Montag looked at the cards in his own hand. I, I've been thinking about the fire last week, about the man whose library we fixed. What happened to him? They looked, they took him screaming off to the asylum. He wasn't insane. Beatty arranged the cards quietly. Any man's insane who thinks he can fool the government and us. I've tried to imagine, said Montag, just how it would feel. I mean, to have farm and burn our houses and our books. We haven't any books. But if we did have some, you got some? Beatty blinked slowly. No. Montag gazed beyond them to the wall with the typed list of millions of forbidden books. Their names leapt in fire, burning down the years under the, his axe and his hose, which sprayed not water, but kerosene. No, but in his mind, a cool wind started up and blew out of the ventilator grill at home, softly, softly, chilling his face. And again, he saw himself in a green park talking to an old man, a very old man, and the wind blew from the park was cold too. Montag hesitated. Was, was it always like this, the firehouse, our work? I mean, well, once upon a time. Once upon a time, Beatty said. What kind of talk is that? Fool, thought Montag to himself. You'll give it away. At the last fire, a book of fairy tales, he'd glanced at a single line. I mean, he said, in the old days, before homes were completely fireproofed. Suddenly, it seemed a much younger voice was speaking for him. He opened his mouth and it was Clarice McLennan saying, didn't firemen prevent fires rather than stoke them up and get them going? That's rich. Stoneman and Black drew forth their rule books, which also contained brief histories of the firemen of America, and laid them out where Montag, though long familiar with them, might read. Established 1790, Vern English influenced books in the colonies. First fireman Benjamin Franklin. Rule 1. Answer the alarm swiftly. 2. Start the fire swiftly. 3. Burn everything. 4. Report back to the firehouse immediately. 5. Stand alert for other alarms. Everyone watched Montag. He did not move. The alarm sounded. The bell in the ceiling kicked itself 200 times. Suddenly, there were four empty chairs. The cards fell in a flurry of snow. The brass pole shivered. The men were gone. Montag slid down the pole like a man in a dream. The mechanical hound leapt up in its kennel, its eyes all green flame. Montag, you forgot your helmet. He seized it off the wall behind him, ran, leapt, and they were off, the night wind hammering about their siren scream and their mighty metal thunder. OK, so that is the extract. I love this extract. It's such a good extract to look at to practice political and social protests. And what's also worth saying is that the more unseen extracts you look at, whether they've been set by the exam board or not, you might get lucky and find trends in other questions and other texts as well, because the genre is the genre at the end of the day. It all uses the same kind of conventions and themes and aspects. So the more you look at, the easier it might be for that unseen extract that you might get in your exam or for your assessment. So this is there's potentially lots to say. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to split the extract into about six or seven sections. I can't remember quite how many. But I'm just going to go through and annotate with you some of the things that I would definitely want to mention in my essay if I was writing this response. So here we go. If I click it right. Um, you can see then that I've highlighted particular sections and I've also annotated around the outside. I'm a bit of an annotator. Um, I love annotating things. Um, so um, that's why it probably looks a bit chaotic on this screen, but obviously you can pause if I'm going too quickly. So if we go right back to the beginning of the extract, we're told that war may be declared any hour from the, um, the voice on the radio. So immediately we can start to include that word dystopian, the dystopian depiction of the story world. And the story world is obviously the world of the story. And Bradbury here has clearly created a dystopian novel. Um, where, which is speculative. It's, it's possible. Uh, we don't know what could be around the corner. It might be that our government one day might make books illegal. We don't know. Um, so um, immediately we get this sense of dystopia coming through. And that also comes through with the planes whistling ahead with the black morning sky. It's not a particularly pleasant utopian world, is it, that's depicted from the get go. In the third line, we have the setting already, the firehouse trembled. So the setting important to the extract as the firehouse is the central location of it and significant in terms of the book burning and how the firemen have been manipulated to carry out the government's rules. 
the firemen haven't made these rules. The firemen are just following the orders of the government. And the firehouse is also personified as if it's frightened. Um, so some of you might also have come across the large and small world theory, which can some, be something else that you talk about for many, many texts. Um, is the large world, obviously, in this extract, is the war, the government destruction of knowledge, whereas the small world is, the fire, is this firehouse and these firemen. So in political and social protest texts, there's often a, a conflict between the macrocosm or the microcosm or the large world and the small world. And that can sometimes be quite interesting because even, you know, uh, small locations like this firehouse can, what happens inside it can be the response or, or be the result of things that happen in the wider society of government, okay? So we then get introduced to BT, and BT was looking at him, Montag, as if he were a museum statue. So that simile conveys a sense of, of, of malevolence from BT's perspective. He has this kind of unwavering stare, maybe quite predatory. There's no way you can hide from him. So immediately we get the sense that these two men have a kind of a, a, a fractured relationship. They're very suspicious of each other, but Montag perhaps is very aware of the power that Beatty has over him as captain. It says there Beatty might rise and walk about him. So it almost reminds me of like predatory animals that circle around their prey. Proxemics is really the study of body language and our proximity, our physical proximity in relation to somebody else. So you can say we have quite predatory proxemics here. Uh, and that creates a sense of paranoia because there isn't any way you can hide. Um, and obviously Montag is hiding something. He's hiding the fact that he's got books in his, pro in his possession that he shouldn't have. So he's definitely hiding something. And from a reader's perspective, because we know that, it enhances the tension and suspense because we want to know if he's going to get found out or not. We also have in this extract an omniscient narrator. Montag is not the narrator, so it's not a, a first-person homodigetic narrator. It's an omniscient narrator. And that enables, really, um, the, to, the narrator or Bradley to really enhance the sense of paranoia and secrecy. Because asking those rhetorical questions there um, obviously um, refers to the fact that Montag is guilty of something he shouldn't be doing, which is hiding books. So for Unseen Extracts, it's always a good idea as well to think about narrative perspective and why a writer might choose a first person narrator. Sorry, why a writer might choose a first person narrator or why a writer might choose a third person narrator. Uh, what is the significance of that? Because clearly it's a it's an authorial choice that has been made. And then we get uh, reference uh, in the beginning of that kind of first longer paragraph about repeated references to burning and fires. Um, the idea that fire and burning is a central motif in this novel. It's what it's, what it's named after, Fahrenheit 451. So it's no surprise that we get lots of semantics, lots of semantic fields to do with burning and, um, and destruction and fire. Um, and that will continue into the next slide as well. So that creates the or conveys the oppressive nature of the regime. The men all look the same. They might be victims of radicalization. They have a group collectivist mentality. And that's where you can ask yourself, are these firemen victims? Because, yes, they're setting fire to the books, but they're only doing as they're told because they don't have the power maybe to rebel. Maybe they've been brainwashed. So that's something else you could talk about for AO5, which is quite interesting. To what extent are these firemen victims? As we move into the kind of the second paragraph here, we have the semantic field to do with um, fire in yellow, continual, continuing uh, throughout. So constant and extended references to smoke, fire, burning and associated ideas. Foregrounds how the firemen have all been manipulated and radicalised into destroying things rather than protecting them from fire. They all look the same. So for AO5, your interpretation AO, think about whether you would argue these firemen are victims or per perpetrators of suffering. Um, what could happen to them if they disobeyed orders, for example? Think about what happened to Clarice. Um, obviously, they don't want to stick their head above the parapet and rebel because that they might pay a price for that. We're also told a little bit more there about Captain Beatty and the way in which he is rising in the thunderheads. Again, the proper noun captain conveys his power and the hierarchical structure of this setting, but also that verb rising in thunderheads, that verb phrase, elevates his sense of threat to Montag. The idea that he is a superior being in this fire station and therefore 
his word is final. So you really get a sense of hierarchy within this small, small world location of this fire station. We then get um, some speech coming through, and this is twice this happens. You can see there by the hyphen, we've got some hesitancy in Montag's speech, suggesting that he's nervous because he's maybe nervous about Captain BT, but he's also nervous because he knows he's rebelling against the rules by owning books in secret. So perhaps what he's doing here through this speech, this direct speech, is he is trying to work out what might happen to him if he was to get found out and in, in possession of these books. It's interesting that we have that verb fixed as well when he says about the man whose library we fix. Clearly, fixed is not here used um, you know, in a constructive way. Fixed means destroyed or set fire to. So you could say that goes to show how these men have been radicalised into thinking they're doing the right thing by a repressive government control. Um, it's the distortion of the truth. Uh, usually, Farman obviously fix something by putting the fire out, but it's been reversed here in this extract to create that dystopia. And then Beattie says, any man's insane who thinks he can fool the government and us. So obviously government and us, government is capitalised, which you could show, say it shows the power of the institution. And also the conjunction and in that phrase there suggests Beattie is putting himself on a level with the firemen um, and the government. They're kind of the same. Um, as if the two groups come together to form an inescapable and oppressive regime. Um, he believes that he's carrying out what's right, does BT, and he believes it's right because the government says so. So BT, despite being kind of the antagonist in this extract, he is perhaps as well a victim himself. Um, so he's putting himself on the same level as the government there. Um, the firemen become agents acting in the government's behalf. And the fact that a man was carried off to the asylum because he had books and was rebelling against that, maybe, shows, again, punishment and unjust injustice or unjust actions, perhaps. It also shows the intrusion of the government on the lives of individuals. So we like to think that we would have free will, we have freedom of choice in a democracy. But actually, democracy is very fragile. And as, it, and, and as I said earlier, democracy only lasts as long as you've got people in power who want that democracy to continue. Um, and here, in this extract, in this dystopian world, obviously the government is taking away that freedom of the individual or individualism. Um, another question to ask is, is that reliable? Did he go to an asylum or not? Did he go somewhere else? We also know that Clarissa's gone missing as well. Um, maybe an asylum is just a, a convenient excuse um, to make them sound perhaps safe. Maybe they've been killed. We don't know. So, again, there's a sense of unreliability here. Uh, maybe not trust what BT says. As we move on, uh, we have again a very short staccato interaction between BT and Monte, again showing that tension between the two of them. Uh, BT quite quickly asks, you got some, as in, have you got any books? So it shows, that interrogative shows um, his underlying menace and suspicion that despite them supposed, supposing to be on the same team, kind of the same team of firemen, they are paranoid and they are suspicious of each other. So there's a conflict between each man there. He goes straight to um, asking him as if he's done the wrong thing. We also here have a typical reversal of the fireman's role. You know, they're using kerosene, which is flammable, to start fires rather than water to put them out. So again, it shows, it sums up how the fireman's job and profession has been manipulated by the government. Uh, to carry out the, their particularly oppressive or repressive um, regime. Um, interestingly, we've then got references to coolness and cold. And again, that contrasts with the hotness of the fire. Um, and again, at this point, we're starting to get flashbacks in Montag's mind that the omniscient narrator is telling us about a ventilator grill. And at first, you might just think, oh, that's a, what, why is he thinking about that? But you've got to ask yourself, why is he thinking of that? And what we suggest, what we infer from that is perhaps that's where he's hiding these books. He's hidden them in a ventilator air conditioning vent, perhaps, because he knows that he's not supposed to, um, to have them. And that's maybe why the temperature goes from hot to cold here, because it's a chilling thought that maybe they might be found um, and um, 
that secret coming out and therefore Montag being shown up for going against the repressive rules of the government and the punishment that might come with. Um, also an old man in the park, perhaps that old man, um, he has been exchanging books with that old man in secret as if they're contraband on some kind of black market. And it's always interesting to think that whenever something gets banned, like a substance gets banned, it doesn't mean it, it disappears. It just goes underground. There's always a black market that will appear. I read very recently about um, a school who banned sugar uh, in food in school. So what some of the year 11 students were doing is they were going to the shop at break time, buying the sugary food and bringing it back in their coat pockets and selling it to a profit to the year sevens and so on. So again, that's rebellion. It's the same thing. Slightly more comic, I suppose, but it's the same thing that whenever you ban something, it doesn't mean you're going to get rid of it. It just means it goes underground. And that's also the same things, you know, with drugs and things as well. So, again, maybe there's a sense here of rebellion uh, going against the expectations of, of what citizens are supposed to do in this in this particular location. Um, we then move on to the next bit. Um, we get reference to the phrase once upon a time in fairy tales. Um, and obviously he admits himself or the the, um, the omniscient narrator tells us that recently they set fire to a book of fairy tales that they went to and it was on a tabletop in a house somewhere. And obviously that's a phrase that often starts fairy tales. And obviously fairy tales are synonymous with innocence and escapism. It's often children that, that read fairy tales. Um, so by burning fairy tales, the regime is eradicating escapism through imagination. Uh, Beattie has a domineering and dismissive tone. The other men are probably intimidated by him the firemen are all a team until one of them does something wrong or raises suspicions. So in other words, they're all on the same side until one of them does something wrong and they turn on each other. But it's interesting that fairy tales have been explicitly mentioned here. Fairy tales are very innocent. They don't cause really much harm. You wonder why they're being burned. What possible reason, what possible threat do fairy tales um, pose? other than escapism of imagination, because obviously fairy tales contain a lot of magic realism, often quite surreal events that don't make sense. Um, so the fact that they're being burned as well goes to show that eradication of imagination and escapism through literature. We then get reference to Clarice McLennan, who's obviously gone missing. And again, this all, all idea about daring to ask the question about the roles of farming in the state. Um, the idea being if you do stick your head above the parapet and you do dare to rebel by asking questions about what's happening, that you will pay the price because you're not following the leader. You're not sheep, in other words, you're not towing the party line. So again, that's why Clarice has gone missing because he dared to ask about what was going on really. Coming forward to the end now, we get reference to Benjamin Franklin. If you remember, I referred to that for one of the earlier slides as being um, you know, one of the people that um, was put in charge of, of bringing about a proper fire service in America at the end of the 18th century. And what's important here is we have this complete clash between the escapism and magic, magic realism and imagination of fairy tales with the very dogmatic imperative sentences of these rules that should be followed very kind of to the, to the law, basically, to the, to the complete and utter fullness of them. Um, brief histories of farming in America you can link here Benjamin Franklin for AO3 and how the regime has distorted the truth here. So again, they've changed the rules. They have made this rule book suit their own um, actions when actually it was written in another, almost in another kind of thinking process of, in mind in order to put out the fires. And the same thing happens with the Bible in the Gilead, you know, in Hamid's tale, they, in the theocracy, they distort the Bible to suit their own agenda. And the same thing has happened here. So this rule book, which we expect, we're expected to be very factual, the rules have actually been changed in them. Um, so all those rules there, one to five, all imperative sentences, show how the rules have been distorted and adapted and manipulated to suit the regime and to almost legitimise what they're doing. Finally, um, the bow sounds and the men go off to set fire to some more books, basically. Um, everything seems the same as it would be normally, as in the fire, the, the, the bow rings and they go off to put a fire out. Here, though, obviously it's been inverted round. The bow means that they have to go out and start a fire with kerosene in their hose pipes instead of water. 
So again, we've got um, words like flurry of snow and shivered, which again is that contrast, that juxtaposition between hot and cold, which is quite interesting. You could also argue here they have a warped sense of duty, um, but, but again, they're victims perhaps because they've had this warped sense of duty instilled into them and they didn't do otherwise. Maybe they know what they're doing is wrong. They didn't sign up to the fire service to do this, but the alternative, which is to leave, is perhaps fatal and therefore they just have to go along with it and follow the orders. And again, towards the end, the last sentence, again, the reversal of traditional roles. They're, they have a very strong sense of duty in the speed at which they're leaving this fire station. But again, obviously, they're doing it in a dystopian way, which is they're going off to start fires quickly because somebody has sounded the alarm that they found books somewhere, perhaps. So firemen become figures of intimidation to the citizens of the place rather than for safety or protection. So, you know, we like firemen because we think they are um, protective. We think that they are saving us. They will save your cat from a tree. But yet here they um, are often figures of maybe intimidation and to be afraid of them. So Bradbury has reversed it round in order to create that dystopia. So that is all fruitful um, quotes and devices that you could talk about for this response to this question. So that is the extract. And again, obviously, this being a video, you can go back and um, make some extra annotations if you want to. But this is certainly the, the stuff that I've highlighted in purple here is certainly the things that I would want to talk about if I was um, writing a response to this extract question. So, again, now that we've analysed it, what I would now do with my students is I would get them to just ask some questions about it. And I would not get, get them to write a response, but I would start to ask some questions in order to just, uh, I suppose, solidify their knowledge of this extract before they go on to write in a, a response. So asking yourself questions about an extract can often be very useful in order to expand. So I've got 12 questions here across two slides. So we talked about location. What is significant about the setting? Um, and how has Bradbury changed the roles of firemen? Um, there is extensive description of how the men all look the same. For example, they look all black from soot. Um, what does this say about every fireman in the station in relation to the government? What does the soot symbolise? You could say the soot symbolises their innocence being taken away. It, it signifies their manipulation, their radicalisation from the government. The fact that they're almost a collective that all look the same as well means that, you know, they're all suffering in the same way or they've all been mind washed in the same way, brainwashed in the same way. What is the role of Captain Beatty? Well, clearly he, within the small world of this location of this firehouse, he is the almost the antagonist. He's very kind of dogmatic and quite strict and, and somebody to be feared almost. But also his role is to make sure the men are doing as they're told in making sure they follow government orders and burning books. Um, but it also sets up a conflict, obviously, between the men and Montag and Captain Beatty, because even though he's one of them, he's almost elevated above them in how he's introduced the novel and how he speaks. We've talked about library we fixed. We've talked about any man's insane who thinks he can fool the government and us. We've talked about the ventilation grill, zooming into that ventilator grill to show that rebellion in owning those books as if they are becoming contraband because they're banned. Um, again, we've talked about the dialogue. Pete is very kind of blunt, interrogative sentence. You've got some. He immediately goes on the defensive and, and asks uh, to check that his men aren't, um, you know, breaking the rules, which is inevitably what is happening with Montag, but they don't know it at this point. Um, and again, this feeling of dystopia, this idea of paranoia, the men not being able to trust each other because they will tell on each other um, whenever necessary. We've talked about fairy tales and once upon a time, um, obviously that imagination, that escapism being eradicated as well. And then we have that imagination juxtaposed with the very dogmatic rules and the imperative sentences of this rule book linked to Benjamin Franklin there um, and, and how they've changed the rules to suit their own agenda. Um, we've done 10 about the relationship between them. The large world is obviously the government and the oppressive book burning rule. And the small world is, is the fire station, and the relationships between the men in that station. And an omniscient narrator, because the, it enables Bradbury to talk about the thoughts and feelings of multiple characters at once, but also create that tension and suspense when we're able to go into Montag's mind and know that he has been doing things he's not supposed to be doing, which is, for example, getting books and hiding them in secret. So asking yourself questions 
could also be a very good way of going through the key points and bringing together all of those annotations in some kind of order. Here we have a selection of terms that would be both AO1 and AO4. Some of these are political and social elements like manipulation, secrecy, coercion, rebellion, and so on. Some of them are AO1, so omniscient narrator, for example, would be AO1 because it's a term associated with literary study. You've got themes like corruption of innocence, you've got uh, draconian is a quite an impressive word, meaning excessively harsh or severe. Uh, totalitarian would also be quite impressive to use and dystopian as well. So all of these themes and aspects of political and social protest we have been talking about today in this video. So we now need to start obviously putting all of this together because we are now working towards putting this knowledge into some kind of response, which is an essay for English, obviously, worth 25 marks. So how do we put all this together? So what we've got to do is, like I said, we've got to take a maximum of 15 minutes to read and analyse the extract, including the synopsis. So we've really got to, before we start writing, we've really got to try and make ourselves as confident as possible with what we are saying. And that means you're spending about 40 to 45 minutes writing a response. Um, and that leads you up to the full hour. So this is part of a three hour paper. Uh, therefore, easy to split it into three, one hour each per question. In a second, I'm going to go through with you a good introduction uh, to start off the essay, uh, which will include these three things. So you've got to really contextualise the extract. So using the synopsis is really important for this, such as key dates, characters, settings. It's really important as well that you give an overview of the extract. You need to say to the examiner what you think is happening in this extract. What is the central action? And also to add in some AO4, political and social protest writing elements as well, to show that you are immediately linking the extract to the genre. Uh, that's also important, so I'll show you that in a second. In your essay, don't go through the essay line, don't, sorry, don't go through the extract line by line, analysing, you know, a device on every line. It's not supposed to be like that. You're supposed to have the freedom to roam around the extract more freely and using bits of the extract that you think you are most confident with and or that you think are most significant to the task. So you don't have to talk about everything in the extract. It might be that your whole essay is about something on the back page. That's fine. Uh, the example doesn't specify you have to talk about a particular amount of the extract. But these extracts are well thought through and often they're very fruitful with stuff. So it's unlikely that all of the information will be just in one corner of it. But you are within your right to do that if you want to. And also importantly there at the bottom, <coughs> excuse me, have confidence in your abilities. Make sure, you know, you have been studying literature now for many, many years and you will have been prepared for this in class and at home and in your own reading. So have confidence in your abilities. Literature is not just about doing a question about a set text. You have enough skills now to be able to look at any piece of literature that you haven't looked at ever before and still analyse it because you're using the skills, okay? So have confidence in yourself. Start this essay by proving what you can do rather than seeing the essay as, as proof of what you can't. So have confidence in your abilities. Okay, so I'm now going to go through with you an example um, introduction. So I'm gonna type this, so apologies in advance for probably what would be absolutely dreadful typing. Um, and I will talk you through it as I go as well as to what makes this exam, this um, introduction particularly effective. Okay, so I'm going to start by thinking about the um, the information that we were told in the synopsis. Again, it's been it's there for a reason, so I'm going to use it because it can help me with dates and characters and that kind of thing. So we're going to start by saying Bradbury's 20th century um, novel. I'll put the title in Fahrenheit. 451 picks uh, a dystopian, so that's effective. I'm already getting that word in AO1 story world by foregrounding, which means kind of bringing into your vision, bringing right up close to you by foregrounding the behaviors and actions of firemen burning books. Um, 
which have been banned um, by a repressive government regime. So I'm using words like um, repressive, banned, government, which is clearly AO4. That's you know a key part of political and social protest writing is the depiction of people in power. Um, I'm going to talk about the setting because the setting is important because we're told about a particular setting for a reason. So the fire station, I don't know if that's one word or two, put it as two. The fire station um, is a central location in this extract because it symbolises um, how the firemen have been, um, how the firemen, um, the firemen act as the government's agents uh, who carry out the destructive um, extermination of knowledge, which is obviously represented by books and literature. The fact, uh, the fact that they um, no longer put out fires and instead start them goes to show the extent to which they have been radicalised. That's another good word to use for this module of political and social protest by a repressive and, say, draconian um, government power. Let's now, so I've used as much as I want to use at the minute from that um, synopsis. Let me just tell it to ignore Story World. Um, so I've used as much as I want. I now want to just contextualise the extract a little bit more. I need to just go through a little bit more um, what I'm actually reading here in this extract to show the examiner that I am Really, I've got to grips with what I'm reading, basically. So in this extract, because obviously the novel is it's a novel, it's large, this is only an extract of it. In this extract, the protagonist, Montag, protagonist meaning main character, is sat playing cards with his fellow men. Um, knowing full well that he has hidden um, and obtained books in secret. Um, this rebellion, that's another AO4 aspect, uh, causes tension uh, between Montag and Captain Beatty. demonstrated through the omniscient narration that is able to detail the thoughts and feelings of each character. Oops. And that would be my introduction. Okay, so let me just make this a little bit larger so we can see it a bit more. Too big. There we go. Um, so that I'm just going to read through that now as, as a whole thing. Now it's finished. So Bradbury's 20th century novel Fahrenheit 451 depicts a dystopian story world by foregrounding the behaviours and actions of firemen burning books, which have been banned by a repressive government regime. The fire station is a central location in this extract because it symbolises how the firemen act as the government's agents who carry out the destructive extermination of knowledge. The fact they no longer uh, put out fires and instead start them goes to show the extent to which they have been radicalised by a repressive and draconian government power. In this extract, the protagonist Montag is sat playing cards with his fellow men, knowing full well that he has, that he has, I should say, uh, hidden and obtained books in secret. This rebellion causes tension between Montag and Captain Beatty, demonstrated through the omniscient narration that is able to detail the thoughts and feelings of each character. So that last sentence, I'm also getting AO2, 
for authorial methods as well, because I'm talking about the meanings of a particular narrative choice. So that would be how he would start it. Really use that synopsis to help you as a, as a guide. But then obviously now you're set up perfectly to go into the extract in more detail. And if you need to, to chunk your essay in, or chunk the extract, so you're zooming into particular bits of most significance. Maybe not. don't try and talk about every single thing you've highlighted. Talk about the bits that you think are most useful to you and that you can work with most. And what I mean by that is, in terms of looking at maybe language analysis or themes or motifs, but also the area four terms like, um, you know, uh, rebellion, uh, power, uh, manipulation, coercion, those kind of terms as well. So I'm not trying to say everything in the introduction, but I do want my introduction to really set out that I am on the right track. OK, so that concludes this video all about Fahrenheit 451. I hope that's been useful. Um, and again, the more you read for A level, obviously, and the more political and social protest writing that you are exposed to, the easier that you will find the unseen extract, because chances are you will see similarities with things you've already read. OK, so in summary, then, with the unseen extract, an hour in total, 15 minutes of which, which should be spent annotating it and reading it, get into grips with it as best you can and then you're ready to start annotating the extract and then obviously writing the essay in full. Thank you very much.